It's almost winter and everyone's telling you to leave the leaves. I also want to add, you don't have to do fall cleanup. That sounds great, right? But what does it really mean? Is it going to look bad? Is it going to kill my grass? I don't want to get in trouble. My HOA, HOA won't let me do that. My husband, my plants are leaning into the road. What if aliens? Hi, it's Lisa. I like plants. Fall cleanup and leave the leaves are two different things that I want to talk about today. Fall cleanup is like a landscaping job that's often done, you guessed it, in the fall, where a landscaper or the homeowner takes a string trimmer, also known as a weed whacker, and cuts down all the perennials to the ground and removes all that dead vegetation. I'm gonna have some extra time on my hands because I am not doing that this fall. In this video, I'm gonna be making a pumpkin pie from sort of scratch and showing you why you don't have to do fall cleanup and what does it mean to leave the leaves. I get to do some fun extra things in the fall with the time I'm not spending hacking away at the habitat. If you don't already know, perennials are plants that grow back every single year from the ground up and you can cut them all the way to the ground in the fall and winter and they'll come right back again full strength. As opposed to woody shrubs that grow a little bit each year and they put new leaves on old wood. Well why not cut everything back if it doesn't hurt the plants then what's the problem? Here's the problem. There are basically three problems with this. Number one, seed heads are bird food. The plants have a lot more to give than just flowers in the summer. Even their dried leaves that are laying on the ground in the winter create habitat over the entire winter. Nothing goes to waste in nature. So taking down these leaves and stems is actually removing something useful. It makes no sense for me to cut my cone flowers down to the ground and then buy bird seed for the birds over the winter. That's doing things a little bit backwards. It's a little bit wasteful. Number two, it's a warm blanket for the ground. When we get rid of all the dead leaves and stuff, that's mama nature's blanket. The ground gets very cold in winter and it tends to dry out. And when it dries out, it kills all the good microbes in the soil. Without this blanket, there's nowhere for little insects to hide over the winter. And when birds go scratching through the garden, they're not gonna find any food. Three, the stems are really important in a native garden. They might look pretty boring, but inside the stems, there are tiny little bees that don't sting. They sleep in there. It's like their little apartment over the winter. In the spring, they wake up super hungry and they buzz around looking for nectar and pollen. Then they come back and lay their eggs in the stem and they seal them in there with like a little ball of pollen for the baby bees. So cute. I don't want to interfere with that process at all, so I just leave the stems as long as I can. So here's an example of an unfortunate case of good intentions cut short in the fall. I know everybody hates HOAs, but this neighborhood has made some good choices for their plantings. This median must have 60 purple coneflowers and lots of nodding wild onion. Both are supercharged native plants, great for bees and birds. They've got some native grass cultivars, that's fine. This is a median on a street. They probably wanted to keep the grass at a safe height for visibility, I've got no problem with that. However, in October, the landscaping company came and sheared all the plants down to the ground. Yikes. They took so much plant material, all the seeds and leaves, you know, some of which I 100% know were still green or had green rosettes, which are good for competing with weeds. Everything is pretty much gone. Now there's nothing covering the ground. The ground is gonna need protection from weeds, which is fine because I'm sure the landscaping company would be happy to charge another $1,200 to deposit three inches of mulch that the perennials will just have to fight through in May when they come up. This isn't the worst thing ever. As I said, the neighborhood was making good, healthy choices for the environment, but unfortunately regarding the winter situation, the seeds and leaves just kind of, they just kind of got wasted. I don't want to hear about they had to clean it up because it was going to look so bad. Purple coneflowers, especially these are short cultivars, like this isn't the 100% native species, I don't think. The purple coneflowers and the grasses look awesome in the winter. Here's what mine look like. If they really start flopping, it usually isn't until February when they get pushed over with snow. Again, I want to say that they did make a good choice and I am not roasting them. Just next year, if it were me, I would have a talk with the landscapers and just say, no thanks, we don't need this service. Just keep an eye on it. You know, if it really starts to look bad in February and March, you can literally hand pull them or whatever if it's absolutely necessary. For real, I think gardens look great in the winter. Most of my stems and grasses are very upright up until like March or April. 
That's when they get really broken down and start to look messy. So only then in the late spring do I cut my grasses down completely and trim back maybe half of the flower stems depending on what it is. I try to leave as many stems as I feel like I can tolerate. I've seen bees use these stems well into June. Like I've seen them go in there and do their little thing. They're probably laying eggs in there, you know, and it's June 15th. So I try to leave as many stems up as I can. Online, some people have started saying that it's safe to cut back the stems as long as it's 50 degrees outside because theoretically the bees who are in the stems are going to come out. My personal observation is that I have seen them using these stems into the summer. So just keep whatever you can during the season. I personally remove a lot of the smaller, like floppy stems, like Black Eyed Susans. They sort of come right out. You can just hand pull them and they're very small. I leave a lot of the more rigid stems, Swamp Milkweed, Joe Pieweed, Queen of the Prairie. I try to leave those stems up because they're really useful for the bees. Sometimes I cut them down, but I try to leave at least two feet of stem. Honestly, we're all just guessing at some of these best practices for the ecosystem. No one has the perfect answer about how to have a perfect garden. The truth is in nature, nobody cuts this stuff down. If it were a prairie restoration, the area would be burned or mowed every other year or something like that. I am not the native garden police. I'm not the lawn police. We're all just well-meaning gardeners who are all doing our best, trying to help the ecosystem with the knowledge that we have. The truth is this is an evolving practice and new things come out all the time. Don't be discouraged if you cut your garden down already. Next year, you can do what you can to leave as much material as you're comfortable with. You can experiment with leaving some things up and you might realize, wow, I actually didn't have to cut that down. That looks great in the winter. Okay, our second fall chore that we're not gonna do is rake leaves. Instead, I'm going to try to leave the leaves. This one has caused a lot of controversy because the truth is, if it's more than a tiny smattering of leaves, the leaves will kill your lawn in spots. The leaves like to clump together in these little spots in your lawn and then you'll have these dead patches. I can already hear the choir saying, yay, kill your lawn, lawn sucks, lawns for losers. Like, I, I get it, it warms my heart to hear that. and and I can get behind it. We have to be realistic. What if your plans are not to kill your lawn? And I tell you to leave the leaves and then you have dead patches. So, I mean, I have to confess, I have lawn myself. I have several hundred square feet of lawn. So I empathize with this situation. But you might not be able to follow this exactly if you do want to keep your lawn. However, for those of you watching this channel, you might be enthusiastic about this. You might be more interested in how the leaves benefit the ecosystem. Leaves give nutrients back to the earth. They cover the ground, they protect soil life. And oh, one more thing, they're not all leaves. This guy right here, he spins a cocoon and then drops from the tree and hides among the leaves because he looks just like a leaf. I mean, look at this mimicry. And that's where he stays the whole winter. Sometimes these guys end up being a tasty snack in late winter for a bird who's kind of scratching through the leaves. You can look outside and see them kind of scratching through looking for something to eat. The ones who are really well camouflaged survive through the winter and that's the next generation. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but when you're raking up, when you're leaf blowing and putting these in bags and sending them off, uh, this is part of what you're raking up. So what can we do about this? I think the best thing to do is to create a safe area around our trees. And this isn't my idea. Heather Holm calls this soft landings. She has an awesome website. You should really go and check it out. Soft landings is placing an area under your tree to allow the moth and caterpillar cocoons to survive underneath. So that means you have an area where there's no grass. Instead, you have a little garden. If you're worried about things not growing under trees, a lot of our native plants will grow under trees. Usually it's kind of shady and dry because it's underneath the canopy. The tree really soaks up a lot of water. Plants like Pennsylvania sedge, Virginia bluebells, wild geranium, Jacob's ladder. These are perfect plants to put under your tree to replace the grass and give these cocoons a soft landing. That way when the leaves fall into the garden, it's really not a problem. They just act as mulch. They will kill grass. They don't kill native plants. And each year you can kind of expand the tree ring and just make it bigger and bigger until it gets out to the drip line. To me, that's the ideal way to give a home to these little moths. You don't need grass right up against the tree. Give your tree some breathing room. You can start by expanding out about six feet from the trunk. If your tree is large, try 10 feet and see how that goes. If you are maintaining a lawn, you can gently rake the leaves into your garden beds. You'll have to find out for yourself by experimenting how many leaves you can leave on your garden beds. Nobody can tell you 
you the answer of like how many inches of leaves will be fine. Some plants do just fine with a, a lot of leaf litter and then others, they need a little bit more sunlight and it's hard for them to push up through so many leaves. So you're just gonna have to experiment at home. The type of leaf matters too. Maple leaves seem to break down very easily over the winter and if you have oak leaves, they kind of form a mat. They're kind of like paper, very thick. It takes them a while to break down. So they're gonna break down at different rates. There is another really good option with your leaves, which is that you can make leaf mold. It's a really simple process. You just make a pile of leaves and you leave it for two years and it turns into compost. Our cousins, the fungi, will break it down themselves and turn it into dirt over the course of two years. However, in this case, a lot of the cocoons are gonna kind of get buried under the leaves. They may not really survive in this situation, but this is much better than having them hauled away. And it gives you free compost. So it's a much better alternative, especially than bagging them in plastic. You might say, well, how can I have a nice lawn? I don't want to do leaf mold. How do I how do I leave the leaves but still maintain my lawn? That's just a tough choice. I mean, having an eco-friendly lawn really is a myth. And there's no judgment here. Like I said, I have plenty of lawn. Um, it's a choice that we all have to make. Uh, some of us need lawn because we've got dogs or kids or we have other reasons that we want to keep our lawn. Maybe we don't have the budget to make a whole garden yet out of all of our property. But, you know, it, it is always a trade-off. So you do what you can with your leaves. Try to to put them in your garden bed. You can make leaf mold. Maybe you can extend the ring around your tree where you can create a new garden and you can put some of the leaves there. This really gives you a reason to build out a garden from the tree's trunk. I think this is the most underused part of the landscaping. We have grass growing right up against the tree where really we could put a garden there. You know, just a three or six foot garden around the trunk and we can start there and just expand out from there. Usually you'll want native perennials that are for dry shade in this area. Most of those plants plants will give you blooms like in early spring. You can also throw daffodils in there. They're not native, but they're like 15 bucks for 50. Uh, you can get them for really cheap and they look awesome and it's better than lawn. They're perennials, so they come back every single year. I really like daffodils, you know, they're not native, but I, I think it's a fantastic way to have your new garden look really good right away. Your first year, you probably won't get a lot of blooms, so you can even put annuals down. If you wanna put dry shade annuals like begonias and patience, stuff like that, you can put that stuff in. That'll only last a year but that'll give you some beautiful blooms for the first year. Just make sure that you also get native perennials. Sedges, ferns, they will do awesome there and that's going to be a great place for those little cocoons to have a soft landing. So while I'm inside making pies and drinking tea, I can look outside and see my garden sleepy but happy. You can do this too. Give yourself some extra time by not cutting things back and not spending money on fall cleanup. In a few months we'll talk about why we're not doing a spring cleanup. I hope you have a chance to enjoy your garden today, every single day, even in winter.